This is Dr. David Howard in his teaching on the books of Joshua through Ruth. This is session number 31, Introduction to Ruth. Greetings, uh, Professor David Howard here again. And uh, in this segment, we're going to be talking about the book of Ruth. So um, if you've been following the video lectures of mine, uh, we've covered Joshua and Judges and now Ruth. And uh, this book uh, follows logically after the book of Judges. And it looks ahead logically to the book of Samuel. Uh, but we'll look more carefully at its place in the canon uh, in a few minutes. But to begin, just to uh, say some general things about the book of Ruth. Um, this, book, this book contains one of the most delightful stories that we ever find in the Bible. Uh, here we see everything sort of working out right for the uh, characters. It's almost a happily ever after story. Um, Sympathetic characters, some uh, sad things to begin with, and then it works out well for everyone. Uh, it's well constructed as a literary piece, and it's often found even in uh, compendiums or collections of world literature as a beautiful example of a short story uh, with an introduction to things, a crisis introduced uh, the climax where the denouement, the working out of things, and then sort of the, the, uh, the wrap up. Uh, so it's praised on all sides as a uh, beautiful literary story, even if people don't maybe believe the actual events in it. Um, tells a simple story, but very pr uh, profound about uh, one family's fortunes in a difficult time. Uh, we told, we're told at the beginning that it uh, takes place during the period of the judges, and we've been talking in the previous lectures about the terrible situations and conditions in the period of the judges, so this is a little ray of hope and uh, a little light shining in the darkness of that period, um, showing God's low-key but certainly sure and steady involvement in the lives of these uh, people and blessing them. So uh, let's talk about the book itself. The, the book uh, gets its title from the main character, Ruth. Um, she's a Moabite woman. She's from Moab, uh, east of the, the, Red, uh, the Dead Sea. And uh, she's not an Israelite. So it's a story of someone who has come into the fold, in a sense, become part of the family of, of God. Uh, not through her bloodlines, not through birth, but essentially by her embracing the faith of um, her mother-in-law and her husband's family. Um, she was blessed by Abraham's descendants. We've talked in previous lectures about the Abrahamic covenant that says that God would bless those who bless Abraham and his descendants. And certainly Ruth was one who affirmed that, uh, expressed and pledged her loyalty to her mother-in-law. And she, in turn, was then blessed. And there's a, a marriage into the uh, household of Israel. And uh, things work out well. In terms of the authorship, in terms of, the authorship of the book, uh, as with all of the historical books, Joshua through Esther, uh, the book is anonymous. We have no record and no, no statement in the book itself about the authorship. We have no statement about the book's authorship anywhere else in Scripture. So essentially, we, we don't know. Uh, Jewish tradition assigned it to Samuel, which might be logical. He lived a few years after this, uh, but otherwise, we really don't know. The suggestion has been made that maybe the author was a woman because of the prominence of two strong, worthy women, Naomi and Ruth. But again, it's a, it's a conjecture. There's just no way to, to know. So in my view, on this issue with all of these books, um, as interesting as these things might be, uh, the scripture does not make a point of something. Uh, we're, in a sense, wasting our time trying to figure that out, unless we're just doing it for curiosity's sake. But it does not really help our interpretation of the book uh, to guess at the author. Um, so we'll just leave it um, at that. In terms of the date of the book, uh, 
the final word in the book is David, referring to King David, whose reign was from about uh, 1010 BC down to about 970. And um, so uh, clearly the book would have been written uh, after that. Um, how long after that, we have no idea. Many have claimed that it was written uh, during the time of David as a legitimation of his reign, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, others have argued that it really was written centuries later, uh, during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the reason for that being that Ezra and Nehemiah both instituted reforms in which they had discovered intermarriage with foreigners and they forced a, a mass, uh, essentially a divorce there, uh, putting away foreign wives from the, from the men in, in God's people. And many have argued that this book kind of shows the other side of the coin, namely the embrace of a foreign wife, um, and she became part of the family of God. And some have argued that this book was written as an intentional polemic against those uh, other books. Uh, I think it's clear that these, this book does show the other side of the coin from Ezra and Nehemiah, but I think there's reasons for the... Um, the mass divorce in Ezra Nehemiah, and there's mitigating factors there that we can't get into here. I'll just give you a little commercial. I have written a book, a textbook called Introduction to the Old Testament Historical Books, and I have a chapter on every one of the historical books, including Ezra and Nehemiah, and I deal like at length with that issue of the, uh, of the reforms in Ezra Nehemiah, the mass divorce, and the ethics of that. So you can check that out if you're interested. But here, um, it, this does show the other side of that coin, and it shows a beautiful picture of a foreigner being embraced by, the, by God's people. Uh, the literary nature of the book, it's been characterized in many different ways uh, as a short story. Underlying that you know, is an assumption that it's fictional. Um, some scholars have, just, have talked about it more of a, of a historical short story, and I think that's a good characterization. There's nothing in this book that suggests that it's fictional. We, as a matter of fact, there's more evidence that suggests that it's not because of the careful attention to names at the beginning of the book, Elimelech and Naomi and the two, their two sons, and then Ruth and Orpah, wives. And then at the end, uh, the genealogy that takes us uh, from all the way from the patriarch, uh, Jacob, and down to David, uh, carefully put together. So it's hard to see this is just fictional construction. Uh, but it is a beautiful literary uh, uh, document in that sense. Um, let me say a word about, a little bit more word about the uh, literary nature of the book. Um, many scholars, as I've noted, praise the book for its beautiful storyline, uh, but when you get to the end of the book, um, you have kind of a wrap up at um, chapter 4, verse 17, where Ruth and Naomi have married. They have a son, his name is Obed. Uh, he's the father of Jesse, he's the father of David. So end of verse 17, chapter four, finishes with uh, David. And then after that, we have a very short genealogy, verses 18 to 22, that goes back to someone named Perez and comes down all the way again to David. And so in some sense, there's a, a redundancy here. Uh, this, and this genealogy, of course, is not uh, part, not couched in a narrative structure, it's just a list. And so many scholars have said um, the, probably the original form of the book was chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 17. That's the beautiful short story kind of construction. And then, perhaps, then many scholars argue that the uh, genealogy, sometimes seen as an appendix, was added at a later time to make more prominent the connection with David and the assumption is that this is done in a very clunky way, a uh, ham-handed way, and uh, it was not necessary. And so uh, these scholars would sort of uh, see this, would kind of dismiss the, the genealogy and see this as a unnecessary and kind of a clunky way that kind of destroys the beauty of the rest of the book. Um, my own view is uh, we don't really know uh, if this was written at the, begin at the time of the rest of the book or later. And in some senses, it doesn't really matter because it, it is part of the final form of the, of the book. This is the form that's come down. There's no manuscript evidence anywhere 
that uh, the book ended at, chap at verse 17 of chapter 4. Uh, so we, if we're going to interpret all of Scripture, we, we're obligated to take it as it is and not sort of slice it up uh, in ways in which we might prefer to see it. So my mantra almost with many of my classes is that uh, our job with, as exegetes, if we have an exegete hat on, interpreter's hat, my job is to interpret the text that's there, not the text that I wish were there or that I think should have been there or should, should not have been there. So as we talk about the book, we will talk about the significance of the genealogy as part of the book. And in some ways, in a literary fashion, it does fit because we have in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, the listing of many names and kind of setting the stage. And then at the end, we have a listing of many names and kind of wrapping up, putting into, into context. So it's kind of bracketed by uh, lists, chapters 1, 1 to 5, and then chapter 4, 18 to 22. What is the purpose of the book? Uh, many guesses, many uh, descriptions of that have been offered. Uh, certainly it's a beautiful book that talks about loyalty and, and family ties and things work out well and we, we, can, we would certainly do well to, to look at it through the, that lens. Uh, as I said, some have seen it as an anti Ezra Nehemiah polemic, um, arguing in favor of more inclusion of uh, foreigners. Some have just said it's not, nothing more than just a pleasing short story, uh, the same way we would read short stories today or um, some of the uh, fairy tales that we enjoy. Um, I think there's more to it than that, of course. I think that clearly the idea of loyalty is there. I think that uh, it, it does show a very uh, beautiful story about a family and God's working in a low-key way in the life of a family. Um, but I think we have to take seriously the references to David at the end of the book. And in that sense, uh, if we see the flow of the books that we've been studying here, uh, Joshua and especially Judges, Judges uh, saying things are, have gotten to this downhill uh, low point uh, because there's been no godly king in the land and we need a king. The book of Ruth then, following upon that in the, the Protestant canon, um, leads us ahead to, gives us one story in the life of the, of the lineage of the, of the great godly king that, that was to come, uh, David, and David is introduced in the very next book, of course, in 1 Samuel. So I think it's there. Uh, we certainly have to think in terms of, the, when you talk about the purpose of the book, we certainly have to think in terms of the, uh, the Davidic nature of it, and I think it's looking ahead to the coming of the godly king David. It's, a, it's, it's part of a legitimation of the kingship of David, but also to show that God's providence is working. Uh, God is not absent the way he seems to be different parts of the book of Judges. God is very much present in the life of one family, and we just see a snapshot of uh, that family a few generations before uh, David comes along. In terms of the place of the book in the canon, as I've just said, um, in uh, our Bibles, most of us who are reading Protestant Bibles, uh, it comes right after Judges, and it fits there because the book begins by saying, in the days when the judges judged, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and it goes on. So right away, we have the setting placed against that uh, backdrop, and it fits very well um, here. In the Hebrew canon, the Jewish canon, uh, it appears in a different place. Um, the Hebrew canon was organized into three major sections. The first five books, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, the books of the law, the Torah, were, Josh, were Genesis to Deuteronomy. Then there's the, what's called the prophets, um, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. Believe it or not, those are called prophets. These are called former prophets. Um, and then right after Kings is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the book of the Twelve. So there's eight books of prophets in the Hebrew canon. Um, different ways of counting. They're the same books as we have there. So the book of the 12 includes what we call the 12 minor prophets. But then in the next section, uh, uh, it includes all the other miscellaneous books that are not included in the first two sections, uh, usually beginning with Psalms and then Proverbs, um, and, or J Psalms, Job, and then Proverbs. And then immediately after Proverbs is Ruth. Uh, the Ruth, is the Ruth is the first of what are of, uh, what are called Megillot, 
and Megillot is the word for scrolls. And there are five uh, books called uh, Megillot. Uh, these are uh, Ruth and Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, and Esther. So these are all five small books. And they, in Jewish tradition later, after the Old Testament, they came to be read at the uh, five different festivals in the life of the, the yearly cycle of festivals. And Ruth was read at the festival of uh, Feast of Weeks, the Pentecost, um, after Passover. Uh, but it's interesting that it occurs right after Proverbs, because uh, let me just point something out here. Um, if you have your Bibles, uh, open to the book of Ruth. Uh, but then I'd also like to show you something at the end of Proverbs. So flip over to the end of Proverbs, chapter 31. And uh, Proverbs ends uh, in a way that's rather famous. Most people are aware. Uh, the book of Proverbs ends with uh, a poem uh, in verses 10 to 21 of chapter 31. Uh, a poem in praise of the godly woman, an excellent wife, something to that effect. And uh, it begins in my version, uh, Proverbs 31, verse 10. It says, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no lack of grain. And it goes on to praise her to high heaven, really. And she's a good businesswoman. She manages her affairs at home in the, in the gates of the city. And, and uh, that's all good stuff. The Hebrew words for excellent wife, in my version, some uh, talk about a godly woman, different ways of translating that. But that term in verse 10, Uh, that term in verse 10 is eshet hayel. And eshet is the word for wife or woman. And uh, this is a word translated uh, worthy or excellent. Um, sometimes uh, it's a word sometimes referred to, um, to men, referring to men. And usually it's translated uh, as valor, uh, the term mighty men of valor. Uh, includes the word uh, kyle there. So uh, we'll say uh, that about Esther, uh, about the godly woman in Proverbs, uh, this is an excellent wife. Now, if we go back to the book of Ruth, uh, in chapter 3, when uh, Boaz is talking to her, uh, he says, um, Chapter th uh, Ruth chapter 3, verse 11, Boaz says, now, now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. In my version, that's the translation. And the, word, the two words there are the exact same thing that we find in Proverbs, eshet chayel. So an excellent wife, ESV translate that way in Proverbs, worthy woman here. Um, some ways it would be nice if the version translated the two in the same way to show the links because they are exactly the same two words uh, in Hebrew. But the point being, it, Proverbs ends with talking about the ideal woman, the ideal uh, wife, let's say. And then we have an example of that in the very next book in the Hebrew canon, a, a short story showing Ruth as an, a paragon of that kind of excellence, uh, that kind of worthiness. So that's... Uh, really interesting connection in the way that the Hebrew canon is, is laid out. Um, it's also interesting uh, in the placement of the book the way we know it uh, with Judges, because the book of Judges also ends with that same word, chayil, uh, in chapter 20. So if you want to flip back a couple pages, um, when it's talking about the men of Benjamin, and this civil war that's entangled the people. The men of Benjamin are, are, are valiant warriors and fighters. And in uh, Judges chapter 20, verse 44, uh, tell us, it says, 18,000 men of Benjamin fell, all of them men of valor, men of chayil. So, uh, and then also, uh, end of verse 46, mentions the same word. So not, we don't think that Ruth was a, a warrior, 
type, but it is interesting, the wordplay. Uh, it fits with the end of Judges. She's, these are men of fighting valor. She is a woman of, of great valor and value and worthiness in, in Ruth. And she's the paragon of virtue, an example like the woman in Proverbs. So that's, those are some things about the place of the book in the canon. Uh, let's talk about the historical cultural context of the book. Essentially, it's the same as we've talked about with the book of Judges. Uh, there's a time of chaos here. There's a time of moral decline. Uh, this appears to be later in the period because it's a couple generations removed from King David, who ascended to the throne in about 1010 BC. The period of the Judges begins around uh, 1400, 1350, several hundred years before this. Uh, the Moabites are the, the, the people of where Ruth came, comes from, and they were um, neighbors geographically, but also related because the Moabites, uh, Moab originally was the son of Lot. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and uh, Moab was born to Lot by the, unfortunately, the incestuous relationship with his daughter in Genesis 19. And so the Moabites and Israelites are distantly related as distant cousins, so to speak. Uh, there's quite a few contexts between the two groups through the Bible. Um, after the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites, as they're wandering in the wilderness, clashed with Sihon, of, uh, king of the Amorites, who had seized control of Moab, back in Numbers chapter 21. Uh, in Judges chapter 3, we read about Eglon, a little Moabite kinglet, whom Ehud killed with a left-handed stab to the, to the stomach. Uh, here, uh, the relationship between Israel and Moab seems to be rather stable, um, and Ruth is able to travel across. Uh, later, uh, there's conflict uh, between Israel and Moab in 2 King, in, uh, Kings, and uh, the worship that the Moabites worshipped, uh, their, their high god was uh, Chemosh, Chemosh, and uh, they also worship Baal and the Asherahs and, and so on, as most of the other Canaanites did. So before we get into the book itself, I want to talk about one more thing and then the, then the themes of the book. Uh, the special thing I want to spend a couple minutes on is uh, something called Leveret Marriage. Uh, and this comes to the Latin term uh, levir, which means brother uh, or brother-in-law. And uh, in chapters 3 and 4, where we have Ruth and Boaz uh, getting ready to be married, uh, there's a little glitch that appears because uh, there is someone who is a closer relative than Boaz, and he says that this man has the rights slash obligations to marry Ruth before Boaz would uh, have any rights. And so many, uh, many discussions of the book of Ruth claim that this, the law of lever marriage, which is actually to told about in the Pentateuch, um, actually is, is what's going on here in the book of Ruth. And uh, I would say no, there's some close analogies, but not exactly. The, the, there's two passages in the Pentateuch that are kind of the backdrop to this and so we'll look at those. Um, the, uh, the first is in Deuteronomy chapter 25. So let me ask you to turn back to that. And uh, this is the passage where the actual leveret marriage is, uh, is mentioned, uh, where a brother, uh, a widow's brother-in-law is obligated to marry her and to have a, a child, uh, a son for her. So let's look at, this, at the context, and then we'll see how it relates to the book of Ruth or how it does not relate to the book of Ruth. So uh, Deuteronomy 25, uh, starting in verse 5. Uh, it says, If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife, and he shall perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. So in other words, if 
woman's husband dies, she should be remarried to his, one of his brothers, not marry outside the, 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 um, the family. And the, word, uh, the English words perform the duty of a brother-in-law, or of a husband's brother. Uh, the Hebrew word behind that is the word yabam. And that word occurs several times here, talking about this brother-in-law's duties. The word only occurs one other time in Scripture, and that's in Genesis 38, verse 8, uh, in the context of Judah um, and his daughter-in-law Tamar. And when Tamar's husband dies, Judah's son dies, um, she comes to him and asks him to perform the duties, the same duties, and the, ver the word is Yavah. The word does not occur in the book of Ruth. So this connection that often you'll see in studies or commentaries of Ruth uh, is not really an exact uh, connection. But let's keep reading the Deuteronomy passage. So um, verse 6, uh, Deuteronomy 25, the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So that's the, that's the way the system should be working. But verse 7 says, uh, maybe it doesn't, it's not going to work that way. Verse 7, if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to per perpetuate his brother's name. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. So he will not do the yabam. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, say, no, I do not wish to take her. Then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandals off his feet and spit in his face. Uh, so that's kind of a dramatic uh, scene. Uh, Ruth did not spit in the face of the near, near kinsman in the book of Ruth. He's not really a brother-in-law. There's just some, a lot of significant differences here as well. Uh, and then it wraps up saying this is how it's going to uh, it works out. So the way it should work is the brother should step in. Um, but as I've said, the, uh, the place in Ruth, uh, the place of that near kinsman, and in Ruth it's often translated as kinsman or kinsman redeemer or just redeemer. Uh, the word there is different. The word is goel. Translated as kinsman or near kinsman or kinsman redeemer. And this is the word used. And that word is used uh, not in Deuteronomy 25 at all, um, but it is used uh, a whole slew of times in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. So that seems to be a closer analogy. So let's look at that passage, uh, Leviticus 25. And there are two sections in that chapter that are relevant to this. Uh, one is in verses 23 to 34. And this is the section of the redemption, the verbal form of goel, uh, the redemption of property. And then in verses 35, uh, to 46, uh, there is the redemption of uh, poor, poor relatives or poor brothers. And so the, the two, those two scenes or those two pictures are, seem to be closer to what's going on in Ruth because the, the word used is exactly the same, ga'el, ga, go'el or the verbal form ga'al. So let's look at uh, a couple of verses here. Uh, Leviticus 25, verse 23. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, says the Lord. We've made that point back in the book of Joshua, that the land of Canaan did not really truly belong to Canaanites, but it belonged to God, even when Israel is involved. It still belongs ultimately to God. God says, you are strangers and sojourners with me, and in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption, there's the word ga'al, uh, of the land. When your brother, if your brother becomes poor, verse 25, and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer 
that's the noun form, goel, shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. And uh, then it goes on through the, through the chapter. So here it's talking about someone who coming in and paying a price to re redeem the land or redeem the, someone who has sold, him, sold part of his property uh, into someone else's possession to redeem that, to get it back uh, to them. And that's, uh, that's sort of the, the thrust here. It kind of shows the value, importance of property ownership or at least stewardship and God, God owns the land but it gives it uh, to people, to individuals, to tribes, to, to the land of Israel uh, uh, in, as, uh, in, in trust. Uh, then similar, uh, in verses 35 and following, uh, the same what should happen with someone who becomes poor, doesn't, does not have land to give, but sells himself into slavery, into servant, servitude to someone else that eventually in the year of Jubilee, every 49th year, they are to be freed up. So uh, verse 35, if your brother becomes poor and cannot maintain himself with you, you shall support him as if you were a strange, he were a stranger and sojourner. He shall live with you, take no interest from him, etc., etc. And then uh, verse, 40, verse 40, he shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. Then he shall go out and be free, and so on. So there's the idea of uh, redeeming a person from servitude, same way as, as the land. Both of these things seem to be behind the, in the backdrop of the, um, the ceremony or the, uh, the institution that we find in the book of Ruth. Having said that, um, it's been pointed out that the specifics in the book of Ruth uh, about Boaz telling uh, this near, near kinsman, uh, this kinsman redeemer in chapters 3 and 4 of Ruth, uh, that he, if he's going to buy this field, that belonged to Abimelech that now has come to Ruth. If he's going to buy the field, he not only gets the field, but he gets Ruth along with in the bargain. Uh, there's nowhere in the Pentateuch that talks about that specifically. So that seems to be an expansion of the law that's not recorded in Scripture, that just became a custom, apparently. Or who knows, maybe Boaz was just putting it, you know, creating that on the spot. But I doubt that uh, because the near relative seems to agree with that, it says, no, I, I, I can't afford to do that because I'll lose my own inheritance if, in, if that's the case. So this redemption of property with a, uh, a wife, a woman to go along with it, is not found in Leviticus, it's not found in uh, Deuteronomy. Now, it has elements of both those passages. Here's the, the widow being redeemed by someone, uh, which echoes in some ways the Deuteronomy passage, Here's the redemption of land, which echoes the Leviticus passage, but it's not exact in either case. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it's a different word, and uh, in Leviticus, it does not mention a, a, a woman coming along with the bargain. So it, most, you will see many, many studies of Ruth talking about the leveret marriage or this kind of custom, but it's not exactly the same as any of those. It's its own little new kind of thing that we find in the book of Ruth, perhaps, over the centuries, some of these other criteria had been added as a custom, not as commanded by God in the, in the Pentateuch. So now I'd like to talk about some, what we might call the theology of the book, or some of the great themes in the book. And uh, we could say this about almost every book in the Bible, but certainly we see it here, and that is the idea of God's, uh, God's sovereignty and God's steadfastness. In the book, um, he is. There's a special focus on God here. Uh, it's interesting to notice. For example, it's a short book. Of course, it's only 85 verses. Uh, but in 23 of those verses, God is mentioned. So a good uh, more than a quarter, close to a third of the book, uh, mentions God specifically. And it's interesting that uh, in 21 of those cases. The mention of God comes from the mouth of the characters. In other words, the characters themselves are clearly bringing God into their lives and acknowledging him and so on. Uh, the narrative framework around it, in other words, the author of the book, as he's writing about the characters, only mentions God twice. Uh, once at the very beginning of the book, chapter 1, verse 6. Once at the very end, chapter 14, verse 3. Otherwise, the references to God are in the mouths of the characters, but it clearly shows God as, as uh, 
involved character in the book, and, and the human characters are clearly uh, acknowledging God here. Um, beyond that, we can see the way events unfold, that God is always there. It's a well-ordered, and, and things just kind of work out well. But that kind of leads maybe to a second point we could make, and that is, uh, ironically, uh, we could perhaps talk about God's hiddenness in the book. Um, we, his role is a steady, quiet one, but as I said, the narrator, the author of the book, doesn't really tell us this happened because God directed the events that way. Or uh, several times, uh, it seems like there's more uh, coincidences. Uh, for example, in chapter 2, verse 3, it, um, about Ruth, it says, uh, as it turned out, she found herself working uh, in a field belonging to Boaz. It's almost like, oh, by, you know, it just so happened that way. Uh, other historical books would probably say God led her to the field of Boaz or something uh, to, that effect, uh, to that effect. Chapter 3, verse 18, Naomi is speaking to Ruth. She says, wait, my daughter, till you find out what happens. Uh, she doesn't say, you know, till God uh, causes this to, to take effect. So in some ways, many commentators have, have uh, compared the book of Ruth to the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, uh, God is not mentioned at all. At all. I, and I would argue that he is very much present sort of in the background and providentially working out. But it seems to me that in the book of Ruth, certainly, uh, the book of Esther, certainly, and to another extent, Ruth, the hiddenness of God is also an intentional part of the book. And the point being that sometimes in real life, uh, we're not always sure what events are directed by God or what events are allowed by God and to go maybe against his will. Um, yes, in the ult ultimately all things work out together f for uh, those who love him, but sometimes God lets things go and he's not, his hand is not quite as involved. And uh, the, the author of the book certainly sort of seems to step back and sit, let that play out in the mouths of the characters, but sometimes is talking, seems to be talking more about just events worked out in, God, in, God, the, in the favor of God's people. Um, a third piece of the puzzle in terms of the themes of the book, um, I would argue, along with many commentators, that it really does uh, fit into this larger, broader, what I would call the theology of the monarchy. Uh, we have a separate video clip where we talked about the, the idea of God's plans for kings in Israel that goes back to the very beginning. It might be good to review that if you haven't seen that one. Uh, but it, from the very beginning, God promises kings to the line of Abraham, Genesis 17 and Genesis 35, and then it promises to the line of Judah, Genesis 49. There's a, a very important passage in Deuteronomy 17 that gives the characteristics of the godly king, the godly king is, to be a, uh, is not to be like the kings of the nations around, uh, but rather there's a very countercultural picture of the, of the godly Israelite king. The king is not to multiply horses and to trust in his own military or trust in foreign alliances, but he is to be rooted in God's word and trust in God to be the, the warrior. So that's a backdrop, especially to the book of Judges, where things go downhill so far, so, so far and so fast, and the author of Judges repeatedly says, there's no king in Israel, everybody was doing it right in his own eyes. Things had gotten to this point, says the author of Judges, precisely because there was no godly king in Israel leading people toward the Lord instead of a decentralized, everybody doing whatever they wanted. And the book of Ruth fits into that pattern, um, particularly on the emphasis on David. So uh, let's, let's take a look at that now, and we'll, we'll kind of go over it more briefly as we go through the exegesis of the book, but turn to uh, Ruth chapter 4. Um, well, be before we just remind you, uh, at the beginning of the book, maybe it's better to start at chapter 1, and notice that uh, the story is from the family of a man named Elimelech, Ab Ab and uh, he had his wife Naomi, two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. And of course, as we read later, we find out Bethlehem is the place, city of David. This is where David is from, and uh, it's in Judah, echoing the promises to Judah back in Genesis 49 that a king would come from his line. Uh, so the stage is, this is a family from Judah, the family from Bethlehem, and Ruth, of course, a foreigner, marries into this family. 
So now let's go to chapter four. And uh, we see this genealogy at the end of the book. Uh, it takes us from someone named Perez, Peretz, uh, through generations down to uh, verse 22, Obed fathering Jesse, Jesse fathering David. So there's the last word in the book is David. And clearly that's the godly king that's going to come in uh, First and Second Samuel. But who is Perez? Um, well, uh, he's, we see up in uh, uh, he's mentioned up in verse 12. So let me, let me come, come to him in a more indirect fashion. Perez El is the son of Judah through Tamar, his daughter-in-law. And remember, uh, Judah's son died, Tamar's husband. She comes to Judah and asks him to perform the duties of the brother-in-law, uh, even though it's the father-in-law. And uh, he refuses. So she dresses up as a prostitute, entraps him. He comes into her. They, she gets pregnant, bears two sons. Uh, Perez is one of them. And so uh, the first thing we can see here is the connection between David and, kind of in a roundabout way, uh, Judah. And it connects David with the promises to Judah in Genesis 49, particularly verse 10, which says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, till he comes to whom it belongs, undoubtedly referring to David, and then ultimately long, in a longer term down to Christ. But certainly in the Old Testament, that it's talking about David there. And so this is connecting David with Judah genealogically, but then also the promises to Judah that we see in Genesis 49. Uh, secondly, uh, we see the villagers coming together, and uh, everyone comes together to the gate in verse 11, chapter 4. And it says, all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. This is to Boaz and Ruth coming together. And uh, they pronounce a blessing. They say, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. And, of course, uh, Rachel and Leah are the two wives of Jacob. So it takes us back there to Jacob. And Leah is the mother of Judah. So in a second kind of roundabout way, we have Judah in the, in the picture here. Uh, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah, be renowned in Bethlehem. So there's a reference to David through, uh, obliquely through his hometown, Bethlehem. And then uh, third, uh, verse 12, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom, Judah, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So there's Judah uh, explicitly. So I think several strands of evidence, some direct, some indirect, at the end of the book are connecting David and the events at this time with Judah and the promises to Judah. So Ruth and Naomi and Boaz stand in a, not a midpoint, but in a point along the way between the promises to Judah and a few generations later, the, uh, the birth of David and uh, his household. So in that sense, it seems to me the book of Ruth is picking up on the, the theology of the book of Judges. Judges is saying, we need a king, we need a godly king. The book of Ruth is giving us one snapshot into the life of the, uh, the near ancestors of David, saying God is around and working, and it's a be beautiful things are working out, and it portends good things to come when, uh, when David arrives. So in that sense, the book is... Besides just being a beautiful story, besides talking about family loyalty and so on, the, the welcoming of foreigners, it is also telling us about, uh, it's a part of the theology of monarchy that goes uh, through, the, through the Bible as well. So those are the major things I'd like to say about the um, book in terms of introduction. So we'll now spend some time looking at the actual chapter by chapter uh, exposition of the book. And so if you have your Bible, turn open to chapter 1, and we will go through the chapters. Uh. This is Dr. David Howard in his teaching on the books of Joshua through Ruth. This is session number 31, Introduction to Ruth. Ruth. 